who can we trust? The answer is no one. We were gonna have to invent a response to racism. The black students have barricaded it with the dean inside and the white students decide to take four other buildings. For a lot of us, Dr. King was kind of the last hope. Your generation has the fight of its lives on their hands. I am joined by Fordham professor of African-American studies, Mark Nason, who while a Columbia student was present for the occupation and protest at Hamilton Hall in 1968. I am very excited to discuss and possibly draw parallels to some of the protests we see today. But first off, I wanna say thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm glad to see young people uh, who are trying to, uh, you know, break through all the chaos that is uh, surrounding us, uh, enhanced by corporate media, which don't exactly tell us what's going on. Exactly. Yes. And maybe people, more people my age can be uh, inspired by the stories of those before us like yourself. And I was very much so when I saw you tell the story on, I believe it was the Bad Faith podcast. The Bad Faith with, podcast, yeah. yeah with no. Brianna that I heard you. And to be fair, you you do the story a lot more justice than I think I could. You're a, quite the storyteller and especially having been there firsthand. So could you possibly walk us through those protests, kind of what were the catalysts for them and the fear sure. and just what transpired okay so the columbia uh, the, the big columbia protest started april 30th 1968 and in trying to contextualize them there are two huge events which create the sense of rage and determination that columbia students were feeling uh, you know in in late april 1968 the first was the ted offensive which occurred um, in the latter part of January 1968. Now, a couple of things, you know, the, the um, U.S. government was telling the American public, we're going to win this war. We've got this under control. And yes, we've eliminated draft deferments for college students, but, you know, we've got, we've got this. And then when, um, you know, the uh, the, the NLF, National Liberation Front, which some people call the Viet Cong, managed to launch attacks in all of the major cities of Vietnam, uh, including uh, coming very close to the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Um, the whole sense that the U.S. was winning dissolved. And, and here is very interesting. The mass media in America turned on the U.S. government after this and started raising questions about the conduct of the war, which is not, by the way, occurred in this crisis in Gaza. Yeah, I was going to say, not something we'd see today. No, um, but the bottom line was, you know, again, if you're a college student, your draft deferment was just taken away. Now you've got a number which indicates your chances of being sent over there. And now all of a sudden we find out that, you know, the whole narrative about the war that the government is giving us is, is based on quicksand. It's, it's just, and so, holy shit, these people, who can we trust? The answer is no one. Yeah. Oh, so there's that. Then a few months later, Dr. King is assassinated. Now for a lot of us, Dr. King was kind of the last hope that the United States, that people in the United States could actually come together to deal with the country's racial divisions and, and, and historic um, exclusion of black people and other people from uh, wealth and opportunity um, and even basic human rights in American society. Now, what people don't realize is there were riots in over 60 US cities following Dr. King's assassination. Um, so if you put the two events together, the Tet Offensive, the assassination of Dr. King, and you're a college student who cares about the Vietnam War, and you care about race in America, you're suddenly feeling there's no one we can look to to address these. We have to take these matters into our own hands because we can't trust anybody else. So, okay, April 30th, uh, 1968. The, the, for the first time, 
the newly formed Black Student Organization at Columbia um, and the largest anti-war group, SDS, organized a joint rally. The issues at stake were Columbia's participation in research for the Vietnam War through an entity called the Institute for Defense Analysis, which had been protested by SDS, and six SDS students had been suspended for those protests. Also, Columbia was building a gymnasium in Morningside Park, a park that is part of Harlem, with a back entrance for Harlem residents who use it like 10% of the time. Oh, wow. I had been arrested a month before with some community leaders and Columbia students protesting the construction of the gym. And we did this as a symbolic act of civil disobedience, thinking it was a foregone conclusion it was going on. Hmm. So the big issues, stop the suspensions of the SDA students, stop the construction of the gym, stop doing war research for the US government. So the, there were this time, there are black student and white student speakers. That never happened before in the, the, the sort of past, uh, uh, post-black power phase of Columbia history, say 1966 to 68. And the plan, there were 500 people at the sundial and the plan was to march on uh, low library, the, the, the uh, Columbia administration building and have a million in the building until something happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm at the front of the line and I'm an, ex, I'm an ex athlete. I'm, I, I actually still am an athlete. I still play competitive tennis, but you know, yeah. so if there was going to be any action, I was going to be in it. As I tell people, you can think of me as a thug professor because I grew up in a tough neighborhood in Brooklyn and had to fight my way. You got to be in that area. Yeah, Crown Heights too. You yeah. know, so, uh, and I went to two high schools. One high school, I got in a fight with six kids and not, got knocked out cold and transferred to a new high school where I beat up two kids in the first couple of days. So, you know, better odds one against two than one. But in any case, so, you know, we have our... The, the, the people in the front, and we have to make a split second decision. There's security guards with clubs guarding the library. Do we overpower them and enter the building or what? Somebody yells to the gym. All of a sudden, 500 people veer off, march two blocks to the gym site where there's a fence. And we, we this time, I, a month before, there were 13 of us. This time, we actually pulled down the fence. Then the police come and somebody says, let's take a building. None of this was planned. The idea was low library. So then we enter the main classroom building, Hamilton Hall, which now Macklemore has a song about it, with Heinz Hall. Okay, so this is the main Columbia College classroom building. And the, they have Black Student Organization and SDS in the building. And there's some tension between the two of the, what we do with the building. Do we leave it open or do we barricade it? And there are also rumors that there are people from Harlem bringing guns into the building. And actually, when I was going to the bathroom or, you know, early, somebody came up to me and said, do you want to die today? An older African-American. And I said, well, I might, but I don't think my friends are. You know, that's the Brooklyn bravado. Yeah. But in any case, um, the black students had the dean barricaded in his office and they wanted to barricade the whole building. Now, all of this is complicated for me because my girlfriend was black and she was with the black students. So we're separated and I'm frustrated by the discussion. So I go to Broadway to get something to eat. By the time I come back, the white students have been thrown out of the building. The black students have barricaded it with the dean inside and the white students decide to take four other buildings, including Low Library, which was the place which we were gonna take initially. So within a day, you have five different buildings that have been occupied, uh, one, Hamilton Hall by black students and the mostly white students in mathematics, um, the architecture, Fayerweather, and Low Library. Now, 
you know, and th those buildings were occupied for seven days. And you talk about outside agitators in current protest. Yeah. Everybody who was anybody came to give speeches there. Stokely Carmichael, uh, H. Rap Brown, Tom Hayden, the Grateful Dead came to play for us in front of the Columbia Student Center. You look up on YouTube, Grateful Dead at Columbia. They played a 10 minute, you know. And, and also, let me tell you, there were people in the buildings who were not Columbia students. There was a group of activists from the Lower East Side called the Motherfuckers. And they ended, sent the group to help occupy mathematics where the most militant people were. Mm -hmm. I was out, but the other thing that was going on was that a group of like mostly football players and wrestlers decided they were gonna stop food from going into the building. So mm -hmm. I was part of a group of radical athletes and neighborhood teenagers who would break through the lines and make sure food got in, you know? So I did that, but then, what pushed them away, 500 black students from Harlem and the Upper West Side marched on Columbia to confront the wrestlers and football players who said, we don't want any part of this. Because the whole fear was that if you, if you started breaking the heads of the black students, there was gonna be a riot in Harlem because you know there had been a riot in 1964 and there was a riot when Dr. King was killed. Mm -hmm. So, for seven days, you have five buildings held and people, you know, by, by students. And, you know, yes, it was peaceful, except did anybody take a dean hostage for a day in current occupations? Like the black students let the dean out after a day from Hamilton Hall. But well, that's nice of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's, a, he's a pretty good guy anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and also, there were these fights going on outside the buildings to get the food in, you know. Um, and uh, so what Columbia did to break up the protests, they cut a deal with the Black students. You can leave peacefully when we call the police to pull everybody out, but we're going to stop construction of the gym. So that was the great victory, which we thought was impossible a month before. No gym at Morningside Heights. So the black students left and then the police came, pulled people out of the building and beat the crap out of anybody watching, which led to the whole campus going on strike for the rest of the semester. Mm -hmm. and so that's my sort of insider view of Columbia then. These protests were fierce, they were continuous, um, they were surrounded by an aura of possible violence and actual violence. And the people were feeling we had no choice. We couldn't, tr you know, that we were going to have to make, we were going to have to stop the war. We were going to have to invent a response to racism because for the mainstream, you know, first Dr. King is killed, then Robert Kennedy is killed. Who, who are our leaders? There aren't any. We have to become our own leaders. So that's my little synopsis of Columbia 68 and 69. And, and I hope I capture the intensity of emotion, the fear. We, we were brave, but we were also scared. Mm -hmm. I am curious because you spoke kind of about counter protesters or people trying to stop food getting in. And you would think that between the Vietnam War shortcomings and the racial tensions rising, that it would move more people to be radicalized. I'm curious if, if between the students and the faculty, was this sort of pushback against the protests in the majority? Was it in the minority? And then moving through, you said you you did a couple other ones. Did they kind of start moving more in line and in favor? That's, with that's the a great question. Okay. You have to understand something about white athletes in America. Look at the whole Caitlin Clark phenomenon. And, you know, why, you're as a white athlete in America, and the last I looked, I was white, and I've always been an athlete, you're surrounded by authoritarian images, hyper-masculinity and patriotism. And you're socialized to this. You're the real Americans. 
the real red-blooded male Americans who are going to make who make this country. And you look down at the other students at at, at Columbia, the jocks called the students who worked hard in school the pukes. So you know, about twenty percent of the students were athletes, and in those days, remember you didn't have a large group of black students at Columbia till 1966. So I came in 62. There were six black students in the entire school oh, wow. out of, in my entering class, six out of 660. So I'm with all these white athletes and many of them are from the South and the Midwest. Some, there was one kid from South Africa who actually was in the South African military so the, the race, you know, I would get in all these arguments with them when I met them. They'd say, you know, um, you know, uh, would you, we can't integrate. Would you want your daughter to marry a Negro? And I would say, how do you know my daughter's going to be white? Mm -hmm. I would joke with them. But they would look at me like I was crazy. And I was the only athlete who participated in the civil rights movement. I would go to protest demonstrations in my varsity sea jacket. You know, and I, these were all guys I, I played ball with. And when you're playing pickup basketball at night, you don't care about anything except the game. You forget the politics. So these, I knew all these guys, I, you know. Uh, but let, let me, at the first anti-war protest we had at Columbia against the Vietnam War in 19, spring of 67, um, I was part of a group, half black. At that time, there were some black students and the black student athletes were totally different than the white student athletes. They were politically conscious. You know, they were more intellectual. And so we're, and we have this 15 of us out of 300 with signs that say jocks for peace. The other side, the 300 wrestlers um, and uh, football players chanting go back to Russia. Mm -hmm. This is at Columbia, 67. They're using the N-word. So a year later, not much has changed yet. However, by 1970, when the U.S. invaded Cambodia, the Columbia football team voted to get on strike. So the change occurred, but it hadn't occurred yet by 68. Now, there were, there, I have this friend, Roger Dennis, who was the best player on the Columbia football team. He was a sprinter and wide receiver. And during the, the, the occupations, he would held meetings at the fraternity houses to try to talk the white kids into storming, from storming the buildings. You know, he was playing a really positive role there. And eventually, all these people, they came around, but it took them, it took them a while. I would say the majority of the faculty was anti-war, and but they didn't like buildings being seized, deans being kept in their office for 24 hours. They didn't like the tactics. And they also didn't like the rhetoric. You know, you had extreme, you know, ho, ho, Ho Chi Minh, NLF is going to win. And, you know, and also we were using, and talk about people saying from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. We would say, free the Panther 21 off the pig. You know what off the pig means? It means kill a cop. Yeah. You have all these kids chanting off the pig. Talk about offense, you know, like I, I, I don't think in retrospect, that's a great idea, but you know, it's, it's what we did. Uh, so I, you know, this movement, it was, it was intense. It, 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 it was it, all encompassing. It took over people's lives and it changed the country because you also had women's liberation and gay liberation coming out of this student movement along with black liberation. Also what today we would call environmentalism, you know, so it was a lot of young people who felt like totally disillusioned with the authority figures in our society who had to invent our new reality. And look, I'm in a department which was created about this. Black studies came out of the student revolts. When I was a student at Columbia, I never, in, in four years as an undergraduate, I never was assigned a book by a black author in any course. Mm -hmm. 
I had never had a black teacher. I did on my own civil rights research. So it, it was student protesters who forced universities to create black studies programs, later women's studies programs, ethnic Latino studies. So there was a lot that was going on, but we didn't know, we didn't have a blueprint. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. We were making it up as we went along. I'm curious what you think's changed in America to where when you when people look back on protests like that, they're looked on kind of more fondly or as historical successes. With the protests now, there's much more derision and scrutiny. And and it seems from how you describe that that those protests were a lot more intense than than what's happening now, but the impact was also felt a lot stronger, I feel. Yeah, well, I think one thing is, you know, these protests are for the most part about something happening in another part of the world. Mm -hmm. It didn't have the direct American component that we had with racism and the gym and the smothering of black voices with, and, and other voices which needed to be heard. The other thing that's different about this protest is there's a whole group of students and faculty who feel personally attacked by it which is Jew some Jewish students and, and, and faculty and, and very powerful Jewish alumni, we didn't have a group of people who felt personally attacked by what we did in this. I mean, the police hated us. They felt personally attacked, but they weren't, they, and they told us when we fuck you, you know, as they hit us. Yeah. yeah. We hope you die in via, you know, my, 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 neighbors are dying in Vietnam while you privileged fucks are doing this. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were pretty open with their contempt for us. It was, and, you know, okay, so the football players and wrestlers, but the, the visceral rage and, and fear that you're getting from, you know, from people who feel personally attacked by this because they, 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 their Judaism is defined by their connection to Israel. That's different. And that adds an, an, another element here, which makes it much harder for the protesters. Because the protesters are being, are being described as bullies and thugs attacking a vulnerable group of people who experienced the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. You want to, you know, and, and, and some of the arguments, you want another, you're, these students want another Holocaust of Jews. We, there was no comparable accusation directed at us. We were called commies, traitors, you know. Uh, A lot of that uh, you still hear today. Yeah, but th this element that we were targeting this vulnerable group of people is different and it makes everything much more complicated. And it also means that there's, we didn't have this group of alumni who were determined to suppress us. That's different. I, so this is in some ways a much more toxic environment to be a protester. Yeah. It's a lot easier to, to tear them down in some ways. Well, it's also, we didn't have people driving through the streets in New York with our pictures on it saying, never hire this person. Yeah. Shit. I got hired by Fordham University in 1970, they never even looked at my transcript, which had censured on it. Yeah. You know, I had no problem getting jobs. Nobody I know did. This, there's, you know, you have, this is, you have a group of very powerful people trying to penalize the protesters for what they're saying and doing. And that we didn't have. Okay, yeah, they were trying to kick us out of school. That that's that that's similar. And, you know, I managed to escape by the skin of my teeth. Some other people, you know, did get expelled because they didn't have famous people like writing letters for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think, you know, this is a very. I do think it's important to bring up the history when people are talking about how violent these protests are yeah. violent. I don't know of anything that happened in any of these encampments even remotely like this. I couldn't imagine if one uh, took a Dean in for a day, you know? Yeah, yeah, let's take a, you know, nobody, no, 
We, oh, wait a minute. We at Fordham, my department was created when students seized the administration building in 1969, took the, didn't let the dean out, and the dean had a heart attack in his office when he was being held captive. Mm -hmm. And that's how my Institute of Afro-American Studies, which by some miracle hired me, got started. So there's, I mean, also you don't, you don't want to romanticize. We were scared. We were scared of a lot of things, you know, the war of, you know, the impact of, you know, of, of if you were in a protest, the police would go crazy on us. I got beaten up in a station house in, in an incident in Brooklyn, you know, and they were saying, you know, you know, if you were in Vietnam, we would have killed you. And it seems to be the perfect combination, as you said, of not happening here. So people don't feel not as many people feel that personal motivation. And then I also liken a lot of it to kind of the prerequisite towards leaning towards like Islamophobic views since 2001. America's, Americans have been a lot less empathetic to things that involve Muslim communities. Oh, absolutely. And I have a friend who lives in South Carolina and she grew up an evangelical Christian so that the evangelical Christians believe that it's part of the Quran to kill Christians. Mm -hmm. So they're predisposed and they're identified, you know, then look, People are predisposed to be, you know, as you're saying, Islamophobic, to see Israel as this heroic little country fighting against the odds of people who had been, you know, subject to the worst mass murder in modern history. So, you know, most Americans are predisposed, if they're going to have to take a side, probably side with Israel, except for the growing number of Americans who are themselves victims of, of various forms of colonialism. The Republican presidential candidate wants to arrest student protesters and deport those who are not citizens and also militarize the border and do mass deportation of immigrants. Yeah. Since a significant number of the students in the, in the encampments are immigrant students, Mideastern, Muslim, some of them are non-citizens, some of them are international students, they are perfect targets for a country moving to the right. Yeah. So what do I think? I think over the next 10 years, the students will totally change the way the U.S. looks at these issues. In the short run, the country's moving to the right and fast. And it's a and, scary thing. And it's scary. And you, you better be careful. Definitely. Most of my organizing, I don't do publicly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I, and I refuse to, you know, publicly identify who I'm talking to who I'm working with because mm -hmm. I need, I mean, I don't care what happens to me at 78 years old. What the fuck? You've but, been through it. I've been through it, but I have to protect the kids like in the encampments. And, and, and also there are people who would lose their jobs if people knew what they thought about these issues. So I think we're heading into a really dangerous period. And, but in the long run, this, this, this is the beginning of a movement that is going to lead to Israel being as, as much of a pariah society as South Africa. But it could take 5, 10, 15 years. And that's when change will take place. The other thing that's going to happen is, and this is already starting to happen, a significant portion of Israel's population, the most skilled and mobile population, is leaving. And they're going to, you know, some of them coming to the U.S. and Europe, some of them are going to Thailand. That, you know, so I think there is going to be change. But in the problem is that the this Israeli government, there's no limit to the violence they will inflict on Palestinians. 
the violence they will inflict on their own dissenters or the steps they would take to make Israel an openly fascist society, while, of course, we in the U.S. do the same thing. So in the long run, I'm optimistic. In the short run, your generation has the fight of its lives on their hands. Mm -hmm. And you're out there by yourself just as much as we are. You're fucked. To, to put it to put it lightly, right? <laughs>